on World Stories This Week. Turkey, wave of arrests. Senegal, dancing on the beach. But we begin in Germany, a country still coming to terms with the fatal shooting of nine people in Munich last week. We have this report from the city as it struggles to return to normality. It's not easy for Jenna and her mother to come here, the Munich shopping mall where the shooting took place. As for many others, it's hard for them to grasp what has happened. But for Jenna, it's especially difficult. Two of her friends were among the victims. I cry all the time. It's so awful to know that you've just messaged back and forth with the person and done fun things together, and now suddenly that person's not there anymore. So awful. Jenna heard about the death of her two friends via text message on the night of the shootings. Both were 14, the same age as her. Anman lived several kilometers away. Some Munich residents have been drawn to the house, probably in an attempt to understand the dreadful deed. I find it harder than ever to understand because the environment he grew up in seems to be a decent one. But apparently that doesn't mean that people don't become sick in the head and capable of such things. Another face of Munich in the days after the rampage. A city defiantly holding on to normality and determined to keep up its reputation as a place of joy, vitality and tolerance. Of course, you keep hearing people talking about Friday night's events, which everyone is obviously very preoccupied with. But a kind of normality is returning too. For Jenna, however, it will be a while before she finds her way back to a daily routine. Summer holidays are supposed to be carefree. But this summer, she'll be going to the funerals of her friends. To Turkey, where an ongoing wave of arrests has followed the recent coup attempt. Relatives of those detained are increasingly concerned for the fate of their loved ones. Desperate family members outside the Silivri prison, 100 kilometers west of Istanbul. For days now, they've been waiting for a word of their relatives. They're behind these walls because they are accused of taking part in the attempted coup. Parents of imprisoned soldiers say their sons were just following orders. My son only had a week of military service left. The commanders told them that they were just maneuvers. That's how they dragged my son into the coup. In fact, video recorded on the night of July 15th suggests that many recruits did not know what the goal of the operation was. These soldiers were apparently told to evacuate a television station. When it became clear the building was the target of a military takeover, they handed themselves in. These parents' only request is that they be allowed to visit their sons in prison. But under the emergency measures now in place, the authorities are allowed to hold people for 30 days without any outside contact. If only I could see him just once, so that I know he's all right. Until then, I'll sit here waiting. Around 300 people died during the failed coup, which the Turkish government says was orchestrated by supporters of U.S.-based cleric Fethullah Gülen. Ankara plans to continue its crackdown on Gülen supporters. But experts say they are not always easy to identify. Not all Gulen supporters in the military can be recognized as such. Many have taken on false identities. And they don't live like religious Gulen followers, which makes them even less suspect. Since he wrote a book about the Gulen movement, this former police officer has been feeling the pressure. He's now under police protection himself.
In India, millions of people find work as cooks or servants in private households. A badly paid and unregulated sector. A new app has come on the market which aims to change all this. A one-room apartment in northeast Mumbai. Chaya Gayakwad lives here with her large family. Chaya dropped out of school when she was 10. She cooked and cleaned informally in different Mumbai homes for decades. The work was backbreaking, the jobs irregular, and the pay low. I had a hard time. My previous employers used to yell at me. They would threaten to fire me if I didn't show up on time or if I didn't do the tasks fast enough. I was constantly worried I would lose some jobs. That changed a year ago when Chaya joined MyDidi.com, a mobile application that connects cleaning staff with households in Mumbai. Chaya now mentors new recruits in housekeeping. The maids receive a fixed salary that gets paid into the bank accounts, conditions that are unheard of among India's domestic servants. It's an industry that's highly informal and unorganized. Chaya takes home nearly 12,000 rupees, or 162 euros a month, nearly 60% more than her previous income. Employees are also given a smartphone and trained in using the app. Founder Johnny Jha grew up with household help, like most urban Indians. With many maids they hired being illiterate or semi-literate, he says his developers struggled to make the app user-friendly. When they see someone coming in a uniform with a smartphone and an entire kit, the difference, the perception uh, that it creates in their mind is, this is someone skilled coming to my home to do a very specific job and not uh, someone who's living in the slum next door. Chaya heads off to a new assignment. She works in about four to five homes every day for an hour each. The company organizes transport to ferry maids to their workplace. Preeti Oak turned to Mai Didi after her regular maid abruptly stopped coming, leaving her in the lurch. She initially had reservations about quality and service and whether she could trust a complete stranger in her home, but not anymore. It was very smooth, no hassles and then nothing, and they would replace, supposing one maid is sick or anything, they would send another maid. So no hassle actually, it was quite, um, relaxing, I would say. I would just tell her once what to do and then we would do our work. For Chaya, joining the MyDidi platform has certainly paid off. But the biggest change, she says, is how she's now treated in a society notorious for condescending attitudes towards household help. Some of my customers actually greet me first and say, Namaste, Didi, how are you? I'm overwhelmed. I'm not used to it. They tell me, you're a human being too. They treat me like a family member. Thanks to technology, India's invisible domestic workforce is embracing modernity and living a more dignified life. Our last report takes us to the Atlantic coastline of Senegal and a dance school with a difference. Here, students from all over Africa learn their moves in the surf or on the sands. Dancing with resistance is what's on today's program. The Ecole de Sable goes to great lengths to improve the dancing techniques of its students. We're dancing on sand. There's tons of it here. And the whole place, the setting, means that the students do everything to really immerse themselves into working their body. Twenty students from 15 African countries like Ivory Coast and Tanzania have enrolled this year. Courses are taught in French and English. Instructions are given twice. Aleva de Vogo comes from Chad, where there's no dance training. His commitment and expression more than make up for his lack of experience. All these dance techniques are new to me. I'm used to the European or disco dance styles. But here I've discovered modern contemporary dance. All the movements are completely new for me. I'm trying to learn everything I can and I've managed to find my feet. 
Germaine Aconé, a star of Senegalese dance, says she founded the Dance Academy exactly for students like Aleva de Vogel. A choreographer from New York supports her. That might be because the three, three-month sessions are hard work. The training with renowned choreographers from America and France is thorough and professional. We're the only centre in the whole of Africa that invites dancers from Francophone, Anglophone and Lusophone countries. We provide scholarships so that students can realise their dream of dancing. Most of the money for the scholarships comes from sponsors within and outside Senegal. The competition to get a place at the school is tough. Prospective students have to prove their dance credentials. But being socially engaged can help too. Aleva de Voga was considered because of his project with street children. He looks after several abandoned children in the Chadian capital, Nada Jemena. He's had to work hard for months to earn their trust. At the dance school, he hopes to get new ideas which he can incorporate in his work. I want to give the children hope. That's my innermost need. I'm not doing it to make money. I just want to make the hard life these street children have a little easier. Aleva de Vogo needs this training to expand his street children project. But first, he has to get used to the formal language of African dance. In the École de Sable, many students learn to interpret their own traditional dances in a different way.